We have a case study here, and it's about pharmaceutical marketing. I'm going to go over some very basic things, executive summary, so if you guys have to leave in a minute, you'll know what's going on, and then what the business challenge and the approach we took for, with it. So uh, we were engaged to do an agent-based pharmaceutical marketing model. Uh, and as John said, it's mainly asked was, what do we do with our DTC spend on our market? Because this market was a little unusual. And Sterling Simulation created an age-based model. We came up with an answer that if they did it, would save them tens of millions of dollars. However, the people who uh, commissioned this model were as marketing analytics. They didn't have control over actually if the marketing money was get spent or not. And when you see the answer, you can probably figure out why there's some discussion about this. So, this company has two competing non-generic drugs in the same market. One of these drugs is a very well-established drug, tends to be an industry leader. The other one was very recently introduced. And they had to look at some trade-offs. How do we make sure that our new drug, which of course has a larger lifespan in the non-generic market, could get a useful market share without cannibalizing their total market share was one of the like, concerns they had. But the major question they had was, when should this company stop their DTC marketing for the newer drugs so they can maximize total prescription sales? So this was the question, and we were like, OK, we can, we can work on this. So traditional way to do this is do a market mix model. I know the inputs, I know what I want to see, I can figure out what to do. And the modeling framework for a market mix model is typically some form of multivariate regression with maybe some other things added onto it. The issue is not, though is that it wasn't just the answer, they want the answer, they wanted insight, they wanted to know why, as Bippin said just now, and it's more and more people want insight, and market mix models they can give you, you know, betas, they can give you like the, the weights, but they can't tell you why those weights exist necessarily. So to get a better understanding of why this is occurring, the one alternative that they asked for is agent-based modeling. And this also allows us to remove some assumptions based on, you know, using regression such as, you know, uh, linearity and the betas to get a more complete understanding of this process. So one thing to know about ABM though, compared to market mix modeling, is that it requires a, almost a completely different set of data than traditional market mix models. So there is some data dependencies here, although in this case, the company had this data, all right? Um, we'll, and you'll see why, because when you, when you see this model, or at least the discussion of it, you'll see that this is not really what, what people would call a marketing mix model. So in, in conclusion about pros and cons, the market mix model is very established. Every, you know, all marketing analytics people understand a market mix model. That's kind of like their thing. And it does provide levers. I can, you know, change the levels of different spends and figure out what's the difference in my market share. The real drawback is it doesn't really lead to insight into what's going on. It just gives an answer. And it also has to conform to regression assumptions. Whereas ABM is much more open. I, can, I don't have all these assumptions and I don't have to worry about uh, certain things. It also, again, provides insight into the process, but it doesn't really take longer than building a market mix model, at least initially, and it does have some very different data needs. So once we decided on ABM, we had to set a platform. That was fairly easy. Uh, that platform was AnyLogic. Uh, why did we choose AnyLogic? Well, one, the company was familiar with it, had it. That's very useful, right? The other one was that AnyLogic provides great, great flexibility. Because, for example, we could have built a system dynamics part of it into the model, and if we had decided to do that, there was nothing else we could use. But in general, we're going to be using any logic. So the model framework, this is how the model kind of works. Instead of just saying we have spins, we might get GRPs, we might then get output, we actually designed the entire doctor-patient interaction because that's what's happening. The company cares about their market share in terms of patients and prescriptions. The way you get those prescriptions is that doctors prescribe them to patients, all right? This is, so that's what we're looking at here. And the model actually, another benefit of this over market mix models is that we actually span the introduction of the second drug in the market timeframe. 
So we actually modeled the introduction of the drug in addition to what's going to happen long term. So the main components of our model, uh, we have patients and doctors. That's fairly self-explanatory. We have the drugs that are involved. We have, uh, then we have the payers, which you know, pay for the drug, at least in the United States. The formularies, which is where, how much does each drug cost depends on who your insurer is, and that's the formulary. And then the sales reps who are actually influencing the doctors as well. So the patients in this model, so the agent, patient agents are all diagnosed with this disease. They don't have, you know, we don't have non-diagnosed patients in this model. Uh, we, do, we do have them come into the model over time, but those are diagnosed. All right, the, the patients have lots of different understandings of them. We have marketing segment, we have SES factors, which payer they have, which doctor they go to, et cetera. And the primary behavior of the patient is that they meet with a physician every three months. This is an interesting case because the disease involved is not life-threatening. So this drug category is more or less elective. And so the company themselves told us that patients don't go to the doctor specifically to get this type of medication. So this is when they go to their normal, everyday, you know, checkup is when they'll go do this, all right? So um, also determining which drug a patient prefers is a big part of their behavior, and that's where the DTC market actually has an impact. But interestingly, the company knew that DTC marketing impact decreased over time. What they didn't know was why, and so we're, we're going to show that. The doctors in the model have different specializations because multiple specializations of doctors actually work on this disease. And they also have differing number of patients. So generally specialists had more patients, a larger patient pool than say a primary care physician. And what that meant was that the doctors learned more quickly and had their prejudices in response to the drugs firmed up quicker. All right, so what the, what the doctor did was they handled the appointments, they figured out what, how they thought of the drug, and also were the people, of course, deciding what drug to prescribe, and dealt with the sales reps. So the model logic for appointments worked is like this way. So the patients, not only do they not schedule specific appointments for this, they may not even discuss this disease with their physician. And as such, there was only a possibility that they would actually start treatment at any given checkup. So this has a very, very long time scale involved. So theoretically, someone could have this condition or this disease and may not talk to their doctor about it for a year and a half from the time that they should have been diagnosed. All right? So the patient has differing awarenesses of drugs based on the advertising they have seen, mainly DTC marketing. Um, and the patient can request a specific drug from their doctor. If they request it, they generally get it. That was actually one of the primary levers to pull was what was the likelihood of a, uh, of a patient getting a drug that they requested. And then the doctors would actually ha um, handle patient requests. So again, if the patient requests a drug, they get it, generally. Then the doctor, if there's no pre preference because they're not aware of you know, the drugs that treat this disease, the doctor would have to figure out what they thought the, the patient should get. This had, there was two primary factors in this. There was the theoretical, well, which drugs are better for this patient based on the patient, you know, specifics, but there was also, what was the doctor's past history with us trying to prescribe these drugs? So let's say that a doctor has five of these patients, and the, he, he has three patients come in about the same time asking for this, you know, drug, you know, for a drug for this condition. The doctor, let's say he prescribes the same drug, and then they all fail in the first month. This is, we naturally believed, this would naturally prejudice the doctor against giving that drug out again. It's like, it doesn't work, right? So, et cetera. And then, if the doctor prescribes a drug, which was most of the time, did he have samples available? If he had samples, the, the patient would get a sample for the first time. Otherwise, they'd be given a prescription, which they had to fill. This is critical because, as you'll see, even if a patient gets a prescription, they may not fill it, or there may be an issue filling it, in which case you may have lost a potential client because first month 
uh, loss on this, on this category of drugs ravages around 40%. And then second month, third month loss is 20% or less. So after appointment, if they, if they don't receive a sample, they get a prescription and they go to try to fill it. At this point is when the payer becomes involved and we're like, okay, do, do they get filled? Well, that had to deal with how much it cost and how much it cost depending on what their payer was and if it was on formulary and if so, what tier of the formulary were they? Were they? So like a tier two drug might cost 100 bucks, a tier two drug might cost 150 bucks. This cash price might be 500 bucks if, if you didn't even have it on, your, on the formulary. If the patient decides to take, you know, get the prescription, they're considered on drug, they go 30 days, then we check for clinical failure on it. And as I said, that had a, a varying base based on duration, all right? Now, if the patient fails on that drug, they will not try it again. And if they haven't failed three times, they go back and once they talk to their doctor again, they will figure out, okay, let's, you know, so I try a different drug. If they fail three times, they simply leave the market. There's a three strikes and you're out type of approach. Now, this is the state chart for the patient life cycle. As you can see, we have that they can start and they don't have a prescription. And then if they ever get a prescription, it might be either a sample or they have to go to get it filled. And if they get it filled, it might succeed or not, et cetera. So this is just an, uh, one of the primary uh, state charts for figuring out where the patient is in their life cycle for these drugs. So the drugs in the model we had, the company, as I said, had two drugs. There was another non-generic you know, brand drug on there, and generics were treated as a single group. Now, what's interesting is that generics have about 50% market share in this category of drug, and as such, uh, that was considered almost unbudgeable. Like, there's no way you're gonna like, eat into that with a, 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 a branded drug. Now, of course, the drugs don't have a lot of behavior themselves, but there's a difference in clinical action because the company's new drug actually had a, a different mechanism of action than the any other drug on the market, which meant that it had a, a higher, it was prescribed more often as a second line or third line drug, the second or third drug you'd get instead of the first drug, which has a very noticeable effect on it. And then did it exist or not in the payer formularies and what was its cost? The payers and the sales reps, payers again had very little behavior, but they held the formularies. Uh, the sales reps would visit doctors and change the doctor's views on what were the drugs good or bad. So sales reps are assigned a pool of doctors. And depending on the specialty of the doctor and the number of patients they had, they would visit that doctor a certain amount of times per quarter, stochastically generated. When they visit, they again would just tweak the, the doctor's preferences, innate preferences for certain drugs, whichever company it was on, and uh, would re replenish their samples, which again is very crucial. So that, that's basically the model and how it worked. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to show you the model because it's highly proprietary, um, but the, then we talk about calibration. So once we did this, the the company wanted a model that was as least as good as a market mix model, which means we had to basically get within a certain, about a percentage point or so of the market shares over time. This took a while because the company had a huge amount of data, just absolutely huge, uh, closing on a petabyte or so. The problem is but the, the data that they, they, we needed um, wasn't very, it was pretty scarce, and so we started having to frick needle in the haystack in terms of how much data do we have? And so we calibrated to market share because that's what they cared about. Um, it did take a while, but we were able to do so. So what happened is once we calibrated it, we were told that you should have stopped DTC marketing for their new drug six months ago. That's what they said. When we looked at it, they're like, because what happened, the, the, the interesting insight was that over time, the doctor's preferences for the drugs basically overwhelmed the patient's uh, preferences, and so it, you weren't able to budget. That was the key insight of this model. The market mix model could tell you how to spend your money. The agent-based model could tell you that it was the doctors that were actually influencing things more and more, and that's where we, you know, go forward. So since you couldn't stop it six months ago, we just basically, you know, gave the response, you, you need to stop this as soon as possible. 
Now, when, um, if you want to talk about, oh, yeah, that was for DTC marketing, but sales rep marketing is always good. This was what marketing analytics expected to hear. Maybe not the exact answers, but they were like, DTC marketing is, has a very, very, you know, diminishing returns on quality over time, but sales rep visits work well. And mainly because of the, uh, the samples. Um, as long as you had samples, you were getting people, you know, work, you know, entering your market more. So the impact, since we can't tell you how much money they're spending on advertising, we can tell you that if they would stop their DTC marketing, they'd be saving tens of millions of dollars a year. You know, and this is really kind of important because um, luckily they were planning on, on stopping within the next, you know, six months to a year, but now they know they should do it like now. So, so there, there's ways to improve this model, and we're looking at some of them. First of all, we want to model pairs more endogenously because really the formulary is a, is a combination of the, the insurance companies and the, company, and the pharmaceutical companies actually negotiating what tier they should be on and um, if they're in the formulary or not. And, and it costs quite a bit of money. So that would be another way, of, another lever of looking at about total cost of this entire marketing system. Uh, we could market competition more closely You'd be surprised, but most, most pharmaceutical companies have actual quite a bit of data on the marketing efforts of their competitors. Um, so we could have, we did mark, look at you know, other people's marketing campaigns. What they don't know is the sales reps activity. And so we could try to get, maybe assume and work more on there. And then also incorporate more anticipated market changes. For example, uh, the, the older established drug for this company is going generic in the next few years. Well, what happens? That's one of the reasons they're trying to build market share now so they can you know, try to lessen the impact there. But that's one of those questions of, well, that, what do we do? So, uh, like, thank you for this. Um, are there any questions?